1964, a man was attending a sports show in Chicago, and he'd been wandering around the different booths when he decided to head over to the archery stand across the hall. Just before he got to the display, he froze in shock and fear. Stood before him was the ghost of his neighbor who drowned nearly eight years earlier. This is the story of Lawrence Joseph Bader. Sometime between May 18th and 20th, 1957, a guy walked into the old round table bar in Omaha. The bartender on duty at the time remembered him as handsome and stocky with a thin pencil mustache and an outgoing personality. He was wearing slacks and a sport jacket while carrying a navy-issued bag on his shoulder and a small suitcase in one hand. In his other hand, he held a guide to bartending. According to the bartender, the man was debonair, well-dressed, and not broke. Then, in a thick Boston accent, the man asked two things. First, he asked if there was any work available, and second, did she, meaning the bartender, want to go out for dinner? The man's name was John Francis Johnson, but soon enough, everyone would come to know him as Fritz. The bartender then told him there might be an opening at Ross's Steakhouse, so he headed there. Then at the steakhouse, the restaurant's owner asked him what he was doing in Omaha, and Fritz said he'd just left the service in the Navy after 13 years because he hurt his back. Now he was taking time traveling the country, and he'd found a room at the Farnham Hotel near the bus station and wanted to stay in Omaha for a while. He told the owner he'd gotten experience bartending in service bars and pulled out a Navy driver's license to prove who he was. Fritz was extremely charismatic, and shortly after starting work at the steakhouse, people came to the restaurant to hear tales of his brutal and unusual childhood in Boston. He told them about how he was an orphan, and how he was found on a doorstep in Boston, and that he was one of 22 kids who were all given the name John Johnson. He got the nickname Fritz either at the orphanage after a character in the famous 1930s comic strip Cats and Jammer Kids, or in the Navy because of a short haircut that made him look German. Which story he gave you depended on when you asked. People also like to hear about his time in the Navy and how he joined at 17 and fought in both World War II and the Korean War before picking up a back injury when he was blown off a destroyer during a submarine attack. And because he was so extroverted and flamboyant, Fritz became well-known and well-loved. People were drawn to him because he was so strange. Like for example, when people came to one of his frequent champagne parties, they found out that there was no furniture in his apartment. There was just a collection of old pillows and a single fish tank containing Siamese fighting fish, which are a kind of tropical fish that like to fight to the death, the winner eating the loser. He was also known as something of a flirt, and brought many young women either back to his cushion-filled home or to his old hearse, known as the hunting vehicle, that he'd equipped with more cushions, a bar, and a Buddha-shaped incense burner. Weirdly as well, he only ever signed his name as Fritz, almost shunning his last name as if it disgusted him, and he only ever dated checks by season with spring, summer, fall, rather than the date. He was so well known for this strange behavior that a teller at the bank was even given the job of calling Fritz to remind him when the season was changing. He also never seemed unhappy, which might have been because he just flat out ignored bad news. He didn't watch TV news or read newspapers and avoided anything that could bring him down. In fact, the only time anyone ever saw him sad was when he was trying to help his friends out and couldn't find a way. Fritz was also known in the area for his charity stunts, and the most famous of these was when he decided to help Omaha's polio drive by spending more than 15 days in a box strapped to the top of a 50-foot flagpole. The only things he ate or drank during this whole period were the martinis his friends would send up to him twice daily. When it was time to come down, the crowd watched as the thin, bearded Fritz descended to the ground. Upon touching the ground, he walked straight over on shaky legs to a convertible filled with glamorous models. They then wrapped their arms around him as the car drove down the street in a celebration parade. Due to his charisma and flamboyance, it didn't take long for him to move from bartending to becoming the DJ of a radio station. He started by visiting the local station KBON to use the equipment to practice when they weren't broadcasting, and in 1959, the station realized he had a talent. They hired him as a DJ, and this took him from a restaurant curiosity to a local celebrity. In 1961, he even transitioned to being on camera, becoming sports director and announcer at KETV, which is a local cable TV station. Fritz also didn't like the idea of marriage, and would often tell his friends who were getting married that they were fools. But then in 1961, he met and married a 20-year-old photography model named Nancy Zimmer, even adopting her daughter from a previous marriage at the same time. The friends he'd called fools would joke with him about it, but he didn't mind because he was happy. In 1964, a cancerous tumor was found behind Fritz's left eye, and in the surgery to remove it, he lost the eye, spending the rest of his life wearing an eye patch. But the new look only made him even more charismatic and recognizable. He was still as happy as ever, and in fact, he'd never been so happy in all his life. 
Fritz was also a keen archer. He claimed to have found the sport when looking for ways to help strengthen his bad back and was a real natural. Soon, he was competing at the state level and became the Nebraska archery champion. Later, the Sanders Archery Company even approached him to represent them at sporting goods shows, and despite his eye loss, he was thrilled to have a chance to travel around, demonstrating his hobby for a little extra money. In February of 1965, Sanders sent him to a show at McCormick Place, which is a convention center in Chicago. He spent the day, as he always did, demonstrating the types of equipment on offer to curious customers, helping to get new people excited to try the sport, while selling advanced bows and other paraphernalia to other people who already enjoyed it. As the morning drew on, he spotted a man staring at him, and the look on his face was odd. It was like he'd seen a ghost. He had no idea who the man was or what he wanted, so he kept doing his job and tried to ignore him. Later that afternoon, the man returned, this time with a woman. When the couple saw Fritz, both seemed to be in shock. Fritz thought that maybe they were archery fans trying to build up the nerve to say hello to the Nebraska champion. But then after a moment's pause, one of the women walked up to Fritz and spoke to him. What she said changed his life forever. The woman said, pardon me, but aren't you my uncle, Larry Bader, who disappeared seven years ago? Lawrence Joseph Bader, known as Larry, was born on December 2nd, 1926 in Akron, Ohio. His father, Dr. Stephen Bader, was one of Ohio's leading dentists and the family was well known in the community. He was one of three brothers and a sister and his upbringing was, in some ways, strictly Catholic. In other ways, his father spoiled and encouraged them to have as much fun as possible. He wanted his kids to have the best lives they could and to be extroverted and confident. Larry, like Fritz, dropped out of school to join the Navy in his late teens and served during the Second World War. After two years of service, Larry managed to get his high school diploma by studying while well in the forces and he decided to leave the Navy to enroll at the University of Akron. In doing this, he realized he wasn't the academic type and only stayed at the university long enough to meet his wife, Mary Lou Knapp, who he married on April 19, 1952. Larry was always the happy-go-lucky type, looking for the next get-rich-quick scheme and unable to focus on one thing at a time. Part of the reason he left university early was that he spent so much time running a small hamburger stall across the campus that he had no time for his studies. Later, Larry and Mary raised three children in the West Hill neighborhood of Akron, and he was known for being a typical man's man and the outdoor type who kept to himself. When he was hunting, he even wore a genuine buckskin, and he had once won a tri-state archery contest. At the same time, he was also a family man and a beer-drinking guy who could talk your ear off. He also sometimes pulled off crazy stunts to make his friends laugh, like eating a whole chicken, bones and all. But he certainly wasn't extravagant the way Fritz was. One of his old friends even said that if Larry had behaved like Fritz had, they probably would never have spoken to him. After marrying and having kids though, Larry stopped chasing get-rich-quick schemes. He settled down to something of a career as a cookware salesman working for the company Fritz Zept at Lifetime Distributors. Unfortunately, being raised by a rich dad who gave him more cash whenever he wanted, he never really appreciated the value of money. One of his neighbors even described him as a high liver and a swinger, but obligations made it difficult for him to live the life he wanted. In the 1950s, a $17,000 mortgage, nearly $200,000 today, and the cost of raising three kids weighed heavily on his $10,000 yearly income. What made things worse was that he owed taxes to the IRS, so he was a further $20,000 in the red. Because of this, he worried about what those debts might do to his family if anything were to happen to him. So he took out a life insurance policy and boosted his accidental death clause so if that something happened, his wife and kids would be taken care of. At midday on May 15, 1957, Larry packed a small suitcase and fishing gear into the back of his Pontiac. His wife didn't like the idea of him fishing after work and she told him she wished he'd just come straight home. She was pregnant with their fourth child and didn't like hanging around the house without him, but Larry just shrugged, turned to his wife and said, maybe I will, maybe I won't. Then he put on his jacket and drove up to Cleveland to resolve some bad checks that customers had given him. After he sorted those issues out, he paid some outstanding bills, including his latest life insurance premium and cashed a check for $400. He decided he would go fishing after all and drove toward Lake Erie. After a long day of sales and debt chasing, he wanted to relax and clear his head. Soon enough, he reached the banks of the Rocky River and pulled up next to a spot called Eddie's Boathouse where the river meets Lake Erie. He then took his fishing gear and suitcase out of the car and headed for the store, and after looking around for a bit, Larry found a 14-foot boat to rent and asked the owner if he could install a set of lights. The owner thought this was strange because Larry also promised the owner he'd be back before dark, but he set up the lights anyway. During this time, the cloud cover was also getting a little heavier, and the renter told Larry that it wasn't such a good idea to be out fishing that day. Storm warnings had been posted, and boating in the lake during a storm could be difficult in the daytime. If he got caught out in the dark, it could be lethal. But Larry was insistent, he really wanted to go fishing and was confident he could handle it. He pulled out the roll of $400 he had, laid the $15 deposit in front of the owner, climbed aboard, started the motor, and then cruised off down the river into the lake. 
Just as the sun was setting, the Coast Guard spotted Larry in his boat and came over to warn him about the increasing wind. Larry told him not to worry and that he'd experienced those conditions before and then waved them away. As you might have expected, three hours later, a violent storm rolled in and battered Lake Erie. The owner feared the worst when Larry didn't return before dark as promised and he contacted the authorities. The following day, the police and Coast Guard began a search and it didn't take them long to find the boat. It was wedged five miles down the shore on a beach in surprisingly better shape than expected. In the boat was all of the gear that Lair had taken out with him, as well as two life jackets and one of the two oars the boat's owner had provided. The only things missing were a small suitcase and Lair himself. The police investigation also noticed that the damage wasn't enough to have caused any real problems, but that there was no sign that the boat had capsized. If the boat had turned over or Lair had fallen out at some point, he would have almost certainly died. The water was way too rough for anyone to survive. Another thing they noticed was that the fuel line to the boat's engine had become disconnected, something that doesn't usually happen by itself. Still, they kept searching for Larry for another two months before assuming he must have gone overboard and drowned. Three years later, in 1960, he was officially declared legally dead. That was until eight years later when a neighbor spotted Larry at the sports convention. Except, Larry was insisting that his name was Fritz and he had no idea who Larry was. The man Fritz had noticed staring at him that morning was a neighbor of Larry's from Akron, Ohio. Despite Fritz's black eye patch and pencil-thin mustache, the man couldn't shake the idea that he looked just like the son of their dentist, Dr. Bader. But it couldn't be him because he had died eight years earlier. Then, unable to shake the resemblance, the man found a payphone and called John Bader, the missing man's brother. John then got a hold of his cousin, Suzanne, who lived nearby and asked her to check it out. And as soon as Suzanne got to the sports show, she took one look at Fritz and couldn't believe it. It had to be him. Even though he had changed so much, the way he behaved, the eye patch, the mustache, she knew it was him. That's when she walked over and asked him if he was Larry. Right away, Larry acted like it must be some sort of joke, laughing off the idea and swearing he had no idea who Suzanne was or the neighbor was. But Suzanne was certain. She asked Fritz if he'd speak to John over the phone, and Fritz was actually happy to do that. He was sure a quick conversation with John would settle it, and a case of mistaken identity would be solved. But when Fritz spoke to John, John knew the voice. It was Larry. He was sure of it. Fritz then agreed to meet John and his older brother Rich, and they chartered a private jet to fly up to Chicago to confront Fritz. Once they finally met up, though, both brothers were sure who they were speaking to. Fritz, on the other hand, continued to deny it and claimed he had no idea what they were talking about and insisted that he was not Larry Bader. He must just look and sound like him, and it was true that the two personalities didn't seem to match. There was Fritz, who was a flamboyant, well-dressed, larger-than-life local celebrity, while Larry was a man's man who was much more dignified and introverted and who liked nothing more than to go fishing alone with his thoughts. But John and Rich remembered the young Larry, the outgoing Larry, the Larry who acted a lot like Fritz. So the brothers asked if he'd be willing to prove who he was by checking his fingerprints against the prints on Larry's naval record. Again, Fritz was actually happy to do this and accompanied the brothers down to the police station to have his identity confirmed. They took his prints and sent them off to the FBI and it would take a day for the results to come back. The next day, Fritz was working his job at the TV station when he got a call from the police. He and Larry's fingerprints were identical. They told him they were either the same person or this was something from outer space or beyond. Upon hearing this, Fritz claims that he was in physical shock. He had no doubt that he was not Larry Bader, and at the same time, it was like having a door slammed in his face. He couldn't remember who he was, and what he could remember apparently wasn't real. But it wasn't just Fritz whose world had been turned upside down. He now had two wives. His first wife, Mary Lou, had to face the shock of finding out her deceased husband was alive just as her grief had subsided enough for her to accept a proposal from another man. At the time, she talked about feeling the same emptiness she'd experienced when we drowned all over again, and she reportedly became consumed with the numbness. She was also Catholic and wouldn't divorce Larry, and she felt like she had to end the relationship with her fiancé. This also meant that Fritz's marriage to his second wife was null and void. And it wasn't just the emotional turmoil that Mary Lou was facing. She'd received $254 in Social Security every month since Larry was declared dead. She'd also been given $39,500 in life insurance, and her mortgage had been paid off. They all wanted that money back, with interest, as did the IRS, which Larry still owed taxes. While all of this was happening, Fritz didn't hide from anything, though. He started sending part of his wages to Mary Lou, but that became difficult when his life began to unravel. He was fired from his job at the TV station, and despite promising to stick by him, it all became too much for Nancy. She asked him to move out, so Fritz moved into a room at the YMCA and began bartending again, with two sets of kids to support on a tiny salary of $100 a week. $50 went to Mary Lou, and $20 went to Nancy. 
People at the time, understandably, wondered if Fritz, or rather Larry, was a fraudster and a bigamist, and charges were considered, but Fritz insisted that he didn't remember his old life. To prove it, his lawyer hired a team of psychologists and neurologists to examine him for 10 days. They used every technique they could think of short of truth serum, and in their report, they claimed they couldn't find any indication that Fritz could remember being Larry, and they were sure he wasn't lying. They also couldn't find any neurotic or psychotic tendencies to explain the memory loss, so luckily for Fritz, in the eyes of scientists, he didn't know he was a bigamist or a fraudster, and because he didn't know, the courts decided they couldn't charge him with a crime. And they wouldn't need to either, it wasn't long after that he started to experience severe stomach pains, and he was rushed to the hospital where they found out that the cancer behind his eye had spread to his liver. And only a few days later, on September 16, 1966, Fritz or Larry died in Omaha's St. Joseph's Hospital at 39 years old. Incredibly, even after death, he remained two people. A memorial was held in Fritz in Omaha, and the next day his body was moved to Akron to be buried as Larry in the Bader family plot. An obituary in the local Akron newspaper read, There is no tomorrow for the man who claims to not remember the past. All that remains is a mystery. And it is some mystery. At the time, Fritz's lawyer put the blame on his tumor. The argument was that the tumor on that part of his brain may have caused memory loss, his personality change, and may even be responsible for his erratic behavior the day he went missing. If his brain had been damaged in surgery, it wouldn't be able to repair itself, so Fritz would never have been able to remember being Larry. At the same time, some people have also speculated that Larry had a catastrophic injury on the boat. This might have wiped his memory, and then his brain could have constructed a new past to help him cope. This has been known to happen, and it's called a fugue state, or a disassociative fugue. When trauma takes place, it's sometimes possible to forget everything that happened before the event and develop a new identity and history as a coping mechanism. With significant trauma and memory loss, the brain tries to find a way to understand what's happening. If you had a fantasy life that you want to live but weren't living, it might fill the void. And a disassociative fugue does sound like what happened to Larry. The only problem is that a fugue state wears off and the older memories return, especially when the person in the state is subjected to stimuli from their old life. Fritz had tried to resist anything that could remind him of that past because he claimed doctors told him that it might be psychologically harmful if he did. Even so though, his old friends, family, and lawyers constantly tried to drag his old memories out. In August of 1965, Mary Lou and her kids even spent two days with Larry. The meeting was good-natured and he liked them, but they remained strangers no matter how hard he tried to remember them. Mary Lou, on the other hand, felt like he was almost trying to convince himself that he didn't recognize anyone. She hoped that one day either his memories would eventually return or he'd stop fighting them so hard. At the same time, other people would keep testing Fritz, asking him questions about the time before the boating accident, trying to tease out a memory from his past life. But right up to his death, he claimed that he could only recall the life he made up, the orphanage, the time in the Navy, and the submarine attack. Even still, fugue states can take years to reverse, and Larry or Fritz didn't have years. He died before there was a chance for his old memories to come back. Interestingly, some memories did linger from Larry to Fritz though. For example, he retained his passion and talent for archery, and it's even been speculated that the real reason he called himself Fritz is that somewhere in there he remembered his old boss, the pencil-mustachioed Fritz Zept. Another theory pushed by psychologists at the time was that he was a modern-day schizophrenic, most likely meaning he suffered from what we now call a disassociative identity disorder. It might be that Fritz was another personality of Larry and took over when the boat accident happened. Maybe something did happen when he was in the Navy and was triggered by the storm at Lake Erie. When this was mixed with the stress at home, the debt, and how his life turned out, the personality of Fritz took over and never let go. This fits most of the facts, but people with disassociative disorders often have some idea that there are other personalities. Fritz spoke about Larry as if he was someone else, constantly referring to him as that other fellow, and even saying, I am Fritz Johnson, and I have never heard of this Baderman until this matter come up. Even when Fritz talked about Larry, it wasn't like he was talking about another part of him. In his mind, Larry was literally another person. But even if he did have a psychological break or injury, how do we explain the missing briefcase and the fuel line on the boat that had been disconnected? Maybe the trauma wasn't just surviving the storm. Maybe someone had spotted the roll of cash he had with him and decided to hijack his boat and take it from him, leaving him for dead. Of course, there was always another possibility. Larry could have simply been a brilliant liar. Psychological testing at the time was not what it is today. Larry could have just wanted to escape from his old life and debts, so he faked his death on a stormy night at Lake Erie and started over. Whether he walked away from that boat as Larry the Liar or Fritz the Flamboyant, his fuel line had been disconnected and his small suitcase and the wad of cash were missing. It seems like quite the coincidence, as does the idea of his tumor causing catastrophic memory loss just at that moment. 
There's also the question of what happened in the time between the storm and his appearance at the Round Table Bar. Somehow, he went from drowned fisherman to debonair bachelor in those few days, which is obviously a difficult thing to do if you're washing up on the shore confused and helpless, but a much easier thing to do if you'd planned it from the start. The problem here is it doesn't explain why Fritz was so cooperative. Why would he volunteer for a fingerprint test? Why would he agree to look after both families with no pushback? All of Fritz's actions seem to suggest that he couldn't remember being Larry. Of course, that also might have been a plot to stay out of jail. If Larry had planned the whole thing from the start, he could have also planned what to do if he were found out. So, what do you think? Was it all a hoax by Larry, or was Fritz the victim of a tragedy? Did he suffer a mental health breakdown due to a terrible storm, or by an attack by hijackers, or did he plan the whole thing to get away from a life he didn't want to live? Hello everyone, and welcome to Scare Interesting. I'm super excited to announce that the first ever Scare Interesting podcast will be airing this Friday, so September 8th at 11am. This is going to feature brand new stories similar to the content you see here on YouTube, and since there are less restrictions on the types of content, some of the stories will be even crazier than what you're used to. So, I'd love it if you guys checked it out at the links in the description or wherever you listen to podcasts. There's also a community post with all the details. Once again, thank you all so much for watching, and hopefully, I will see you in the next one.